and begin with you, Dr. Mehta. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Mehta is an oculofacial plastics and orbit expert who serves a local and international community in his practice near Washington, DC. He has written extensively in peer-reviewed journals and textbook chapters, in addition to giving talks at various conferences around the country. Welcome, Dr. Mehta. Thank you. Thanks for being here with us today. Next, we're gonna go over to Dr. Gary Linkoff, who is a dual Ivy League educated facial plastic surgeon. Dr. Linkoff pursued advanced art training in painting, sketching, and sculpture, including a six-week scholarship program in Florence, Italy, at the Lorenzo di Medici Italian International Institute. Dr. Linkoff has a private practice for facial plastic surgery and hair restoration surgery in Manhattan. Welcome, Dr. Linkoff. Thank you, April. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks for being here with us today. And to all three of you, a tremendous partnership with Hope Beauty, so thank you each. Last but not least, we have Dr. Michael Ogilvie, a plastic and reconstructive surgeon who is a double board certified surgeon by both the American Board of Surgery as well as the American Board of Plastic Surgery in Chicago with his highly personalized approach and meticulous attention to detail. Dr. Ogilvie strives to fully understand his patient's goals and to provide realistic expectations and results by employing a breadth of surgical and non-surgical aesthetic and reconstructive procedures to enhance the face, breast, and body. Welcome, Dr. Ogilvie. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. So we're going to open up our round of questions. We're going to start with you, Dr. Mehta. What kind of brow procedures do you perform at your practice and how do they work? Sure. Um, so there's actually uh, a lot of different ways to address the brows. Um, and it really depends on, um, you know, each individual patient and exactly how much of a lift uh, that they want for their eyebrows. Um, so there's probably about four different ways to do them or that I do them. And so the uh, sort of on the easy end, the uh, more conservative end is uh, sort of an internal brow lift where uh, we make an incision in the eyelid actually, so a little eyelid crease incision, and then you tunnel your way up. Um, and then that really, you know, it gives you a very conservative lift. Usually I combine that with my blepharoplasties uh, where, uh, you know, that's removing some of that extra skin from your eyelids, but it's a very good uh, procedure for people that are already undergoing a blepharoplasty um, and uh, just really want a very conservative lift. The other, uh, the next technique that's a little bit stronger, but also pretty conservative is an external brow lift where we make an incision kind of right in the brow hairline. Um, that can give you a couple more millimeters, a little bit stronger than the internal brow lift. Um, but then, you know, the drawback is uh, there's, there is the risk of an external uh, scar that is sometimes visible, but it still heals very well. Uh, the fourth way, it, or sorry, the third way is a, a temporal brow lift where we make an incision right kind of in the hairline to tunnel through uh, to the eyebrow and really get that outer brow lifted up. Um, and that's, you know, pretty conservative as well. It does a very good job though for people that have a very droopy uh, outer brow. And then the uh, final way uh, is kind of the sort of the big lift really uh, does a really nice job of lifting the entire eyebrow and that's called an endoscopic brow lift. That's where I make a couple incisions in your hairline, tunnel down and really you can get a very nice, um, very strong lift throughout the entire brow. And so it really depends on A, what kind of brow or how much of a lift you want, um, what other procedures you're undergoing and um, yeah, and sort of how much surgery you want to undergo. Thank you, Dr. Mason. Mm -hmm. We had a quick mute yeah. moment. Have you been doing video consultations as well at your practice in the interim? We have, yeah. Um, so, you know, they I do uh, video consultations. We'll do um, just photos even for a lot of cosmetic procedures. Um, you know, at the end of the day, I think um, we still need a, an in-person consultation, I think. Uh, but a, a video consultation uh, is a great way to get things started, get learn more about the procedures. Um, and yeah, uh, just through our 
uh, office, we can set up something very quick and easy. Uh, that's uh, very easy to do. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Dr. Linkoff, over to you. Sure. What is an Elia lift, lip lift, and how does it work? So it's really my version of the lip lift. You know, lip lifts are getting more and more popular. So the idea is that instead of just non-surgically putting filler in the lips that brings the lip generally out and down and covers the upper teeth, it's really the opposite with the surgical lip lift for the upper lip. You're bringing the lip up and back kind of towards the face. So it ends up being much better for like reshaping the lips for a nice long-term solution. And um, it's just a different look than, than filler. It's a bit more natural um, and it, it's much more longer lasting, lasting. So I have a couple of modifications to how I do my lip lifts. Um, it has to do with how much uh, sort of undermining underneath the skin that I do of the amount of skin that's left over. I basically create um, two separate, there's a separate flap for the skin um, that's taken, peeled off the muscle that's underneath. So when you take that skin and you put it up to the base of the nose, where the incision line runs, it ends up being just less tension on the closure and tends to heal better. Um, and then I also use something called methylene blue as a way to uh, properly kind of keep track of where things go when you're trying to realign the lip at the end of the procedure. So those few modifications, so I've kind of created my own little um, spin on the lip lift. And the idea for people is just to reduce the filtral length here to increase the volume of the upper lip and to show more of the upper teeth. So people end up liking that. Thank you, Dr. Linkoff, and thank you for your partnership as well. Yeah, of course. Dr. Ogilvy, over to you. Yes. A breast expert question. For someone that has breast implants, what is the time frame that they should be looking at replacement? So, uh, you know, the previous teaching and sort of the original dogma was that uh, implant needs to be changed every 10 years. Um, as implants in technology has improved, uh, a lot of plastic surgeons now feel if it's not broke, you don't have to fix it. So a lot of implants now have gone last 15, 20 years, and a lot of companies are now giving you know, 15, 20 year warranties on their implants as well. So my philosophy and my practice is that if the implants are doing well and you're not having any problems or symptoms, I tend to leave them alone. Uh, although I do follow up with my patients uh, every, at least once a year just to check the implants and make sure they're not having any issues or problems. Thank you, Dr. Ogilvy. Of course. Dr. Mehta, over to you. What cosmetic procedures do you perform for the eye sockets? For the eye socket, so, um, you know, there's different things. It really depends, again, what, what the main concerns are. And so usually uh, most people come in with a complaint of their eyes being uh, too bulgy or where it feels like their eyes are kind of very prominent um, and come in, you know, kind of uh, bulging out of the eye sockets. And so um, we definitely have to do a, a very good review uh, of their health first, really make sure there's no other medical reasons for uh, bulging eyes or for prominent eyes. Now, the most common cause for bulging eyes or very big prominent eyes are, uh, is thyroid eye disease. And so we definitely check for that. Um, and then we'll get some sort of imaging, uh, like a CT scan or an MRI to look for any masses or tumors in the eye sockets. Um, and then after that, we really need to figure out, is it the uh, eyes themselves that are bulging or is it something with the lids? Uh, but once we kind of narrow it down, make sure there's nothing medical going on um, and you really are interested in kind of getting your eyes set back, you can do or we offer um, a what's called an orbital decompression. Uh, and basically what that does is you have to think about your eye socket as a, kind of like an ice cream cone where the cone itself is made of bone and that's your eye socket. And so there's not a lot of space because it's very tough. There's not a lot of place for the eyeball or the ice cream to grow except forward. So in order to set the eyes back, we have to kind of smooth out and take out some of that bone to create more space. You can also take out a little bit of fat while you're back there. And it's, uh, you know, it's not without risks. Uh, going behind the eye is there's always risks of bleeding and infection and things like that. Um, but you can actually, you can have a very nice result and there are uh, different sort of uh, techniques where if you want to go back a millimeter or even more than a millimeter, 
Um, there are, you know, there's, we can uh, decide exactly how much bone to take out or how much fat to take out. Um, so that's probably the most common is for bulging eyes, uh, doing an orbital decompression to set the eyes back. Very rarely, uh, patients will come in also feeling like their eyes are too far sunken in. Um, and if that's the case, again, we, got, we have to go through a uh, very good medical history, get some imaging, make sure there's nothing else going on in the eye sockets. Uh, but uh, we can bring the eyes forward and that's by adding volume. And it's usually uh, some form of implant into the eye socket to bring the eyes uh, forward uh, just a little bit. And so uh, those are offered for cosmetic reasons as well. Thank you, Dr. Meta. Mm -hmm. Dr. Linkoff, over to you. What options do you provide for hair restoration there at your practice? So I am a hair transplant surgeon and I happen to have alopecia areata myself, which is an autoimmune type of hair loss. Um, so I can definitely empathize with my hair loss patients. And my condition has actually been progressive over the last few months, so it's kind of crazy. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so all types of hair restoration options. Um, you know, a lot of, mostly procedural. Um, there, of course, you know, for different types of hair loss or different workups that you would do. And I do some of those, but a lot of people come to me for an actual procedure, like for non-surgical PRP, which is taking a patient's own blood, spinning it down and injecting platelets into the scalp to promote hair growth. That's a temporary type of hair restoration solution. Um, there's also surgery that's a bit more permanent. So taking hair from say the back of the head, where it tends to have different genetics compared to the front that tends to thin in men and women. Um, and doing a, what's called a hair transplant. So taking those hairs one by one and moving them to the front of the scalp. Uh, it can be done to do hairline lowering procedures like for uh, sometimes for transgender uh, patients or, or other patients. And I also do hairline lowering surgery, which is a little bit different. So instead of taking these grafts and moving them from one place to another, it's an actual incision um, done at the front of the scalp and basically bringing the whole hairline down and resecuring it um, at a lower point. And that can be combined with a, a brow lift um, as well, but usually it's done kind of as a, as a standalone procedure. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, I take hairs out using the strip procedure or the one by one FUE procedure. Um, and I use a machine called the Trevellini. That's my machine of choice because it's um, it's oscillating. So instead of sharply punching through the grafts and risking transecting the follicle where it's no longer usable, um, I use a, a rotational type of vibration device and it's much more gentle on the hairs so that you're not destroying the hairs as you're planning on moving them. Thank you, Dr. Linka. Sure. Over to you, Dr. Ogilvy, our breast expert. Who is a good candidate for breast reduction surgery? Um, so breast reductions are a pretty uh, significant portion of my practice. Um, really, it's any uh, person with usually larger breasts who have particular symptoms, and those can range from neck and back pain to rashes under the breast, um, just sort of uncomfortable posture, as well as difficulty finding clothes. Um, I also uh, deal with a lot of teenagers who are going through puberty and have large breasts who are dealing with more psychosocial issues in terms of teasing or sort of them looking, uh, you know, kids looking at them at school. Um, so usually it's a very symptom based. I would say the most common are, you know, neck pain and back pain. Uh, the first thing is just to make sure that uh, the patients are healthy and can undergo surgery. So that, meaning they don't have a lot of comorbid conditions or anything that would preclude them from undergoing surgery. Uh, but most patients who do seek uh, reductions are fairly healthy. Um, and then after that, it's really dependent upon, you know, the amount, amount of breast tissue they want removed and what their ultimate look is that they're looking for. Thank you, Dr. Ogilvy. Of course. Doctor, actually, let's go over to Dr. Mehta. Mm -hmm. What parts of the face do you use filler on and what are your most common requests? Yeah, so uh, being in sort of a specialist mostly around the eyes, my most common request is uh, doing it in your tear trough. Uh, so as we age, um, basically what happens is some of the fat in our eye sockets comes forward 
Uh, and then as we're aging also, our cheeks tend to drop. So in between that transition, you do get this little bit of hollowing appearance. Um, and so for some people, um, what we can do is just inject a little bit of filler. Um, usually it takes either about one vial, sometimes two, um, to put it to really smooth out that transition. But the goal is to always uh, smooth out that transition between the, the eyelid and the cheek. Um, so that's my most common. Occasionally, I will be asked to do uh, fillers um, in the cheeks. So you can kind of do uh, get a little bit of a mini cheek lift um, by injecting fillers there. And then uh, very rarely, I do get asked uh, to do fillers in the lips. Uh, that's a, We're getting a little bit further away from my uh, area of expertise once we go down there. But, um, but I've done lip fillers uh, all throughout training and uh, Usually, you know, it's easy enough to do and uh, with good enough results that uh, we'll, I'll offer that as well. Thank you, Dr. Mm -hmm. Reza. Dr. Linkoff, over to you. How do you work to fix facial paralysis issues? Yeah, so for facial paralysis, it's not really a highlight of my practice, to be honest, but I do offer um, Botox injections for patients who are suffering from facial paralysis problems, basically uh, paralyzing the side that still works um, to try to create a little bit more balance with the side that's not working as well. Um, there are also static procedures, so things like a brow lift can sometimes help. There are also static slings that can be applied to lift up, like the cheek, for example, um, using things like Gore-Tex and other types of stuff. Uh, there are dynamic ways of um, improving facial paralysis. So when someone actually smiles, that uh, side of the face that's not working um, can kind of move along with the dynamic movement of the smile. Um, those are sometimes done with like um, what's called free tissue transfer, taking uh, muscle or other kind of uh, structures from one part of the body, moving them to another. I don't do those types of procedures in my private practice, so I would send patients um, somewhere else uh, you know, to get those done. Uh, but there are non-surgical um, and surgical options, and depends on also, the most important thing is usually figuring out what the cause of the facial paralysis is. Is it something that's temporary and will resolve on its own? Um, or something more permanent. So for example, I four months ago had an episode of Bell's palsy and that's something very temporary. So you wouldn't wanna get too aggressive on treating that because that's usually just time um, is all you need to, to see improvement. So again, you gotta figure out the cause, diagnose the, the actual you know, reason for the facial paralysis and then you know, deal with um, ways of improving it. Thank you, Dr. Linka. Yeah. Dr. Ogilvy, over to you. Yeah. What is a Silhouette InstaLift and how does it work? So Silhouette InstaLift actually is something that I've incorporated into my practice. It is a form of thread lifting. Um, so thread lifting back in the day was used with permanent sutures that had uh, little cuts placed in them to create barbed suture. Uh, and those uh, barbed sutures were used to catch the dermis or the under, under surface of the skin to help lift them up. Um, that had a lot of issues and complications. Um, namely, they would have erosion of the suture. The suture could be visible through the skin, uh, as well as infections were something that was very prominent. So. Uh, that got pulled off of the market. Um, however, back in, uh, I want to say 2012 or 13, uh, Sinclair, which is a company in Europe, developed something called the Silhouette InstaLift, which uses a, a suture that is dissolvable. Um, and instead of knots and uh, instead of barbs, it has knots and cones. Um, and these are placed through very small uh, punctures throughout the skin and woven through a different layer. So it, instead of catching the dermis, uh, it actually catches what's called the retaining ligaments of the skin, which is sort of the connections between the skin and the underlying muscle layer. Um, and so these knots and cones sort of act as a parachute that help pull the skin up uh, and to place it where you want. Um, the nice part is that it's been proven to be very safe. It's a dissolvable suture that lasts about a year. Um, and uh, there's no sharp edges. So there's been no evidence of erosion through the skin or really, and because it's at a deeper level, um, they, you can't really visualize it through the skin. 
Um, and the nice part is, is that it, there's no surgery involved, but yet it's about a 45 minute to 60 minute procedure. Um, and the results have been shown to last anywhere from 18 months to about three years. Thank you, Dr. Ogilvy. Dr. Mehta, over to you. What is the cause of lazy eye? And is there a non-surgical treatment for it? Yeah, um, it's a good question. So when we think of lazy eye, we kind of have to differentiate between is it because the eyeball itself or is it something with the eyelid? So a lot of people will uh, call a, what's a lazy eye if they have a droopy lid or something like that. So kind of differentiating those two uh, is important. Um, now, if we're really talking about the eyeball where it's not moving as well as it should, if it kind of lags behind or drifts out, um, again, you know, we have to look at into why it's there. So kind of a theme, what you're hearing about all of these issues is uh, got to rule out a medical cause for this first. So if someone's had a lazy eye forever, the most common cause is congenital, meaning they were just born with it. Um, and so um, usually surgery, surgery really is the uh, best way to fix that. Um, if the vision in that eye is not very good, you can sometimes implant a little, uh, put in a little prism in your glasses, if you wear glasses, um, and that can make the appearance of the eye uh, look like it's looking straight ahead. Um, but otherwise, usually it does require surgery uh, one way or another to really adjust the uh, eye muscles uh, so that your eyes are, at least when you're looking straight ahead, they're even and they look symmetric. Um, and also improves the strength. But really, at the end of the day, or before you do any sort of a procedure, you really have to rule out any medical causes. Um, if it's something that just developed, uh, something that's recent, um, that raises the concern for, a, uh, for an actual medical condition. Um, and that usually requires some sort of imaging um, uh, to really make sure there's no strokes or tumors or anything that's uh, preventing this from preventing your eye from moving around. Um, but, you know, short of surgery, there really isn't much that can be done for, um, for a lazy eye. Thank you, Dr. Mason. Mm -hmm. Dr. Linkoff, over to you. What is philatrum contouring? So philatrum contouring is basically like an add-on to a lip lift. You can't really do it as a standalone procedure because you need access to the philtrum, to the muscle. So this isn't something I do a lot. No one does a lot of these, but this is sometimes something that I offer to patients that have a very flat philtrum. And usually they're the ones that are asking me for it. I always tell, I always tell them it's like double the recovery uh, time compared to just the lip lift. So um, again, it's something that they really have to want, but it's basically deepening this uh, area here, the philtrum. So in some patients, it's totally flat. And if they're looking for a little bit of, of depth, um, I can work with the muscle. So with the lip lift, we're removing the skin only. Um, with philtrum contouring, I'm getting to the actual muscle and essentially trying to recreate that divot. And it's just a longer recovery period. And, and uh, so it's not something that is um, what most patients want or get, but for the right candidate, it could be a, a nice little um, addition to a lip lift. Thank you, Dr. Linkoff. Over to you, Dr. Ogilvy. You touched on this a little bit, but can breast lift, can a breast lift with implants provide symmetrical breast? Uh, the short answer is absolutely. Um, so uh, I always tell my patients that breasts are sisters and not twins. Uh, and so most uh, women have asymmetric breasts to some degree. Um, and that symmetry, while important, is not always the most necessary outcome. Um, however, if there are significant differences between the breasts, um, then a, there can be different options. That really depends upon what is the difference in the symmetry. So is there a volume difference? Um, is there a what we call ptosis or nipple uh, difference between one side versus the other? So if the, the nipples are in the same position uh, and it's just a volume difference, then typically that just requires an implant. Um, however, if there is a significant difference in volume as well as the um, hanging of the breast, 
then many times that will require what we call a mastopexy augmentation, which is where we add the implant as well as lift the breast to give them symmetry in terms of volume as well as nipple location. Thank you, Dr. Ogilvy. Dr. Mehta, what's the average age for a lower lid surgery? You know, most of my patients um, have been in their probably 50s to 60s uh, for lower lid blepharoplasties and um, any sort of lower lid cosmetic procedure. Um, but really, I think the youngest I've seen is probably in their uh, mid or late 30s. Um, and so, you know, occasionally you do get um, some patients that really just have very bulgy lower eyelids. Um, because again, it's just that orbital fat that has really come forward. Um, and so usually we do see it in a slightly older population, but it's, it's not, I would say, you know, completely uncommon to have it in patients that are in their 30s, uh, late 30s at least. Um, and so I've operated on late 30s and then a couple early 40s as well um, for, uh, for lower lid procedures. Thank you, Dr. Mehta. Mm -hmm. Dr. Linkoff, over to you. What treatments do you offer for brow rejuvenation? So, I mean, similar to Dr. Mehta, I do offer direct and indirect brow lifting approaches. So making incisions by the lateral uh, eyebrow itself or in a crease of the forehead if someone has like deep uh, right um, Those aren't my preferred, but for some patients, the, they're totally happy with those and it's fine. Um, Preferably, I like to do a temporal brow lift. So it's another way to say it is a lateral brow lift. So also something similar to what Dr. Meta described. But there's, it's important to clarify, there's sort of two depths that you can, um, uh, you can use to do that type of lateral brow lift. So yeah, the incision is just behind the hairline. But then you can take a kind of a more superficial route and go just under the skin and sort of go down, pull on, on, um, on the area and remove some, some extra skin. That's one way to do it. Um, there is an increased chance of getting some hair loss in the area. And also the result may not be sort of as long lasting as taking a deeper dive, getting to some of the deeper planes in that area and really sort of releasing some of the ligaments and bringing this area up. If you do that approach, usually you don't have to cut out any scalp tissue and you can still get a really nice long lasting lift. So that's my preferred, but with that deeper approach, someone needs to usually be under deep sedation um, instead of just local anesthesia. Uh, that's my preference. And then of course, you know, the, yeah, you can use an endoscope um, for like kind of a, a four or five port um, entry for like a more extensive brow lift. But in most patients, the lateral brow is really what descends over time. Um, plus, I find that I don't really need the endoscope to do that more um, extensive brow lift approach. Most of the time, it can be done with very small incisions in essentially kind of not a blind manner, but as long as you know you're in the right depth, you don't really need an endoscope to visualize everything if you're, you know, if you're used to doing um, that type of approach. So um, those are kind of some modifications, but uh, more or less, it's similar to what Dr. Meta said. Thank you, Dr. Linkoff. Dr. Ogilvy, over to you. What was your road to becoming a breast augmentation specialist? Uh, well, it was a long road. I actually did 12 years of training. Um, so I did a general surgery uh, residency before. Um, and then really, the, it was not until I started my plastic surgery residency, uh, which was a three-year training, um, that I did a bunch of breast procedures, breast lifts, breast augmentations, um, as well as I did a specialized aesthetic surgery fellowship uh, where I did focus mainly on cosmetic breasts. Um, so uh, long road of training, just like my counterparts here for their specialties um, and lots of experience. Well, you're fantastic. And again, we're very thrilled to have you. So thank you again. Thank you. This next question is going to be for all of you. We're going to start with you, Dr. Mehta. What new technology in each of your respective fields are you the most excited about? It's a great question. Um, you know, so what I think uh, for ocular plastics, there's, there's so much uh, that around the eyes that we do. So whether it's the eyelids, the eye sockets, 
or your tear drainage system. Um, you know, I think the one thing that I'm most excited about are really these um, additional therapies or additional procedures that you can get done in addition to a regular surgery. So whether it's a lower eyelid or an upper eyelid blepharoplasty, there are all these new devices on the market uh, that really help deal with tightening up the skin around the eyes and can do it in a relatively safe way um, without um, causing too much, too many uh, side effects or too many complications. And so um, one of the big things, uh, you know, lasers, for example, have always been, uh, have been around for a long time, whether it's a CO2 laser um, or some sort of resurfacing laser, but there are newer devices out there. Uh, so microneedling and radio frequency, for example, are sort of newer, lighter devices um, that have quicker turnaround, quicker recovery. They do require sometimes multiple treatments to kind of get the, uh, the results that a single treatment with laser would have gotten you originally, but um, they really do have uh, just quicker recovery. Um, and it can really be sort of a, you know, sort of a lunchtime uh, skin tightening procedure. And so, you know, I think the most uh, exciting thing that we're hopefully in our practice will get, be getting soon is some sort of combination of radio frequency and uh, microneedling device. Thank you, Dr. Meta. Mm -hmm. Dr. Linkoff, how about you? Well, first of all, you know, I don't think that the latest and the newest technology is always the best thing for the patient. So kind of starting with, with that premise. And um, I'm kind of a little bit more old school in that I think sort of tried and true um, surgical procedures are sometimes the best thing for my patients. And I tell them that. And I always give them options of some of the other new technologies that are out there, some of which I might have and many of which I don't have in the office. And if they're really interested in those, I send them to the right place. Uh, that being said, I am looking to incorporate more thread lifting into my practice for patients who are in their 30s specifically and who come to me asking for a facelift and I think they're too young for a facelift. So I think thread lifts are a great way to go um, in addition to obviously the Botox and the fillers. Uh, and there are new threads coming out that are, are more elastic than uh, the current like PDS type thread that exists um, with most companies. And so that last more elastic type of thread might be um, just a better fit for, for the face and, and many patients and might give a more, uh, you know, just a more realistic type of uh, look more natural. So, so that's what I'm looking into now for my practice. Um, but, but yeah, just to kind of caution people that sometimes what they read as like the, the latest greatest thing maybe hasn't, hasn't been tested long enough or just really won't give you predictable, um, excellent outcomes as can sometimes be achieved with surgery. Thank you, Dr. Linga. Over to you, Dr. Ogilvy. Um, well, sort of along the lines of Dr. Mehta, um, I think one thing that we deal with a lot is sort of skin sag of the body um, and you know, also called ptosis. And, a lot of uh, patients who are not necessarily ready for surgery or are not candidates for surgery, but still want to help improve the tightness of their skin. Um, and so, you know, the radio frequency has been a very um, interesting concept to me. And, it, and there's been um, newer machines like the Morpheus and the Accutite and Body Tight. Uh, which are more minimally invasive. There are, there are um, apparatuses like Venus Concepts, which is more of a completely external uh, radiotherapy. Um, but these are things that are, are very interesting to me as they continue to progress because uh, it's something that a lot of our patients deal with. And even in surgeries, when you say doing a tummy tuck or a mommy makeover, after a few years or after five, 10 years, there can always still be a little bit more sagging of the skin and they don't necessarily want another surgery. Um, so these are nice adjuncts to sort of help tighten that skin and sort of prevent moving forward with another surgery. Thank you, Dr. Ogilvy. Over to you, Dr. Mehta. What's the most rewarding procedure that you perform there at your office for you personally? Yeah. Um... So, you know, I, I'm relatively recently uh, out of fellowship. So honestly, I just love being in the operating room, um, whether it's for just a little ditzel or a big 
uh, brow lift or a little blepharoplasty, really whatever it is, I truly love it all. Um, I think, you know, right now the most uh, rewarding for me is it's very straightforward, but I really love blepharoplasties. Um, it's especially upper lid blepharoplasties. I think it's, you know, just a very simple, straightforward, very elegant procedure. Um, most of the patients have uh, really good outcomes. Um, and it really does make a difference, really makes people feel better, look better uh, for a relatively conservative procedure. And so um, I think for now, that's, that's probably my favorite. Um, I also really enjoy Mohs reconstructions. Um, and so it's, you know, not really a cosmetic procedure, but for people that have uh, cancers around their eyelids um, and they have it removed by a dermatologist or even a ENT doctor or whatever it is, um, they, uh, you know, they need some sort of reconstruction. It really is a fun procedure to do because you never know what you're going to get, how big the defect is. And it's really kind of putting the pieces, trying to fit a puzzle back together in a way to, you know, where they can, we can preserve their eyelid or find other ways to protect their eyeball. And so, uh, I would say, you know, blepharoplasty is for sure on the cosmetic side. Um, and then just Mohs reconstructions uh, for the functional procedure, some of my most favorite ones right now. Thank you, Dr. Meta. Mm -hmm. Dr. Linkoff, over to you. Is hair restoration permanent? Well, it depends on what type of hair restoration we're talking about. A hair transplant usually is permanent. Um, however, a couple of things to keep in mind. First of all, with a hair transplant, um, you're taking from areas that are supposed to be uh, less susceptible to loss compared to other areas. Now, if you've selected the proper donor area, then that's true. But if you've selected maybe potentially into an area that was going to thin out anyway, now those hairs that you've transplanted are not going to be permanent. So it's proper selection of the donor hairs. That's kind of point number one. Point number two is that the area where you're putting the hairs, if, it already, if there are already hairs presently there, right? If someone has still has, maybe they're thin, but maybe they still have some hair. That hair will ultimately thin out more in most cases. So when you're putting in the transplants, and if you have existing hairs, you're going in between the existing hairs and respecting the existing hairs because you don't want to deplete those, you know, for no reason. Um, and, but imagine that now those existing hairs disappear and you're only left with your transplant. You'll still have areas then that um, don't, have, don't have as much density as most patients would want. So it's not uncommon for people to need additional procedures later on, similar to you know, many other types of plastic surgeries where over time things change and you need kind of like a, a fill-in procedure or just like you would you know, lift the face back up after say 10, 15 years, even if you had an amazing facelift the first time, things still have a tendency to change. Um, and so similar with hair. And so, yeah, I mean, the hairs you put there, as long as you've selected from a good donor area are permanent, but you have to keep in mind that one procedure may not be enough for a, a lifetime of the individual. Thank you, Dr. Lingo. Dr. Ogilvy, over to you. How common is breast implant infection and how do you treat an infective breast implant? Um, implant infections are actually fairly rare. Um, I would say usually no more than, you know, two to 3%. Um, typically it depends upon how aggressive the infection is. So if uh, someone calls me and says that they have redness of the breast, um, I tend to treat them with antibiotics first. Um, and I will sort of have a very short leash to bring them into the hospital and give them IV antibiotics. However, if those, if that, those uh, maneuvers don't tend to resolve the redness or if there is any breakdown of their incision or if I see fluid around the implant, then usually that means that the implant needs to come out. Um, I will, in those cases, remove the implant um, and treat them with usually IV antibiotics for about six weeks um, and allow their body to sort of recover over three months. And then after that three month period where I'm fairly sure that the infection has cleared, I can then go back and place a new implant. Thank you, Dr. Ogilvy. 
Over to you, Dr. Mehta. What is your most requested procedure? Yeah, um, you know, the most requested is uh, definitely a blepharoplasty again. So uh, whether it's an upper eyelid is probably the most common, uh, but also oftentimes we can, we would do a, a lower eyelid blepharoplasty. And so really, I think, um, you know, those are very elegant procedures. Um, you know, nothing is without risk, but uh, for the most part, those complications from those surgeries are truly, truly minimal. Um, and so it's, um, it's a, these are fun procedures for me to do relatively quick uh, with overall good results. And so um, blep blepharoplasties, I would say, are the, uh, the most common right now. Thank you, Dr. Mm -hmm. Mason. Over to you, Dr. Linkoff. What do you have the most demand for, hair, hair restoration or hair transplantation? Uh, well, both. Uh, you know, most people will come in with a specific sort of goal in mind. So they'll want, uh, you know, to tr get a hair transplant for one part of their scalp. But there are people who come see me for just hair loss in general to just try to figure out what, you know, is causing the hair loss. And so then we'll do a workup. Uh, it tends to be more extensive in women than in men because of different hormonal changes that occur. So we're doing a lot more uh, blood work for women than men to kind of figure out an underlying cause. Uh, but, but again, it's, um, yeah, so it's, it's both, I would say. It's, it's, um, it's a combination of the two. Thank you, Dr. Linkoff. Over to you, Dr. Ogilvy. What are the pros and cons of each for going underneath the breast tissue or over the muscle? Uh, that's an excellent question. So when you put an implant underneath the breast tissue, that's called a subglandular approach. Um, the nice part of that about that is you don't affect the muscle at all and therefore you don't have any morbidity from disrupting the natural attachments of the pectoralis major muscle. Um, secondly, um, it, um, you don't have, won't have any what we call animation deformity, which is where uh, sometimes if you put a implant underneath the muscle, the muscle, if they say are someone who works out heavily um, or has very large pec muscles, it can sort of distort the, the implant as they're doing things, uh, which can cause movement of the implant. So you would avoid those things if you were to do it subglandularly. The issue though, when you do place an implant underneath the, the glandular tissue, is that patients are more susceptible to what's called capsular contracture. Uh, the way I describe capsular contracture is we always develop a capsule or a scar around an implant, regardless of how it's placed, uh, namely because that's what the, the body does when you place a, a foreign body into it. Uh, the issue is capsular contracture is when that scar gets overactive and it can become thick and painful and it can sometimes distort the implant or cause uh, those types of problems. And so when you place an implant in the subglandular plane, uh, it can, uh, it has been shown in our literature that uh, patients are more susceptible to capsular contracture, which happens about 15 to 20% of all patients who undergo implant placements. Uh, the beauty of placing them underneath the muscle is that that uh, risk of capsular contracture is significantly reduced. Uh, also, the implants are a little bit more protected, um, but you do run the risk of sort of that animation deformity, which I talked about. Um, there's actually a new technique, which is called subfascial which is where instead of actually disrupting the muscle itself, we actually will raise up the fascia over top of the muscle, which is kind of like, a, um, it's like a leathery plane that sits on top of the muscle to hold it in place. Uh, and we can actually lift that up and leave the muscle in place and put the implants underneath that layer. Uh, that's a rather newer technique, uh, but uh, you know, indications show that um, it has sort of all the benefits of being submuscular without having uh, animation deformity concerns. It also has a lower risk of capsular contracture rates, uh, but uh, they're also not visible or um, you know, have the problems of a subglandular placement. 
Thank you, Dr. Ogilvy. This next question is going to be for each of you. Going through the pandemic, you know, as markets start opening up, things, you know, slowly resume back to normal. What's been your biggest takeaway through this entire experience that you're going to apply back to your business? Starting with you, Dr. Mita. Well, you know, as a physician, um, it's always been kind of go, go, go from the moment you hit med school. And so these last two months where things have, where we've been kind of forced to slow down um, and just really kind of appreciate little things in life. And, uh, you know, I got two months that uh, I would have never otherwise gotten with my daughter. Um, and so it's, uh, it's been a lot of fun. And I think, you know, what kind of lessons we can apply to business is that um, I think in general, people will come back uh, very slowly. People are very, I think, afraid right now, um, but they will slowly come back trickling into clinics. Um, and I think it really does kind of put things into perspective um, about what's important in life. And so it's, you know, I, I think the important things here uh, for, from a business standpoint is A, make sure everyone is otherwise healthy. Um, make sure we do a lot of screening to make sure our clinics are, again, become a, a safe place and not just another, way, another location where people get infections and other uh, diseases and things like that. And so really just to make sure that we're offering a very safe environment for people um, and uh, doing sort of best practices to make sure that people stay healthy. Um, and then honestly, you know, it's also made me realize that um, these, uh, these procedures and things um, are still important uh, for patients because they, uh, you know, I've been being out of, uh, out of the clinic for the last two months, I've had patients still contacting me about their surgeries and asking when are things going to open up? When are, when is our surgery center going back to full swing. And so I think, um, you know, people still love their, love to have their procedures done. It helps them feel good, uh, helps them look better. Um, and so I think people are really looking for normalcy. Um, and as long as we can sort of deliver it in a safe way, um, I think that'll be the most important thing for business is really just to make sure people feel safe uh, so that we can go kind of go back to the as best of a normal um, scenario as we can. Thank you very much, Dr. Mm -hmm. Mesa. Over to you, Dr. Linka. Biggest takeaway applying back? Well, I mean, I think it's given me a chance, that, other than also what Dr. Mesa said about spending more time with family, that's been great, but also to like for my practice to take a step back and look at all the inefficiencies. That's something that I don't think we do enough of because you just get so used to, you know, paying certain bills and, you know, having certain people be part of your practice and you don't always think about, are they the right fit for the practice? Are they really helping you um, grow and, and prosper as a practice? Um, you know, for me to do the procedures that I do, I need to make sure that the business is healthy as well. So I really was able to um, optimize things for the practice that I think will help it going forward. And without this time, you know, you're just like what Dr. Mada said, you're just so like involved with, you know, seeing your patients and doing surgeries and just going home and you don't really kind of zoom out and see like, what can I do to make it all kind of better? Uh, so that was an amazing opportunity that I had. And it's also made me really thankful for having a little part-time job that I have uh, working with the VA, partly to kind of give back because we became like a COVID center um, at the Brooklyn VA. So that's been super interesting, sort of being on that um, front of it as I had a neck surgeon and kind of going back to some of like my, the core things that, uh, that I trained in. Um, and also having like a steady income there um, was really nice during this time because my private practice is, I don't take insurance, it's all kind of aesthetic stuff that I can't do right now. Um, but I do appreciate all of the, you know, continued interest from current patients and, you know, potential patients that are contacting me and I may practice to, you know, see when we're opening, talk about procedures, you know, over the phone. And the one other thing I'll say is, some people are waiting for me to like start doing in-person consultations, but I think for the foreseeable future, probably for the rest of 2020 at least, I'll be doing 
almost exclusively video consultations and as, a, as like a first kind of screen, if you will. And if it's a good fit, you know, between me and the patient, then, and if I feel that I need to see them in person prior to actually signing up for the surgery, or if the patient really requests it, then we'll do it. Um, but I think a lot of the times it's kind of like this, you know, you're talking about pros and cons of a procedure, people come with a lot of questions. So instead of doing that big conversation in person, when there's always risk of inf infection for the patient, from the patient, um, you know, new people entering just the physical space, I think it's better to reserve those conversations in, in this, for this type of format and then really do what's absolutely necessary in person. Um, so that's something that I'm changing, at least I think for all of 2020. Thank you very much, Dr. Linkoff. Dr. Ogley, last but not least, how about you? Um, well, I think really I would piggyback on both Dr. Linkoff and Dr. Mehta. I mean, this time has really taught me to you know, stop and smell the roses and to enjoy time with my family. Um, as well as to really look at my practice and look at new ways to improve. Um, I think, you know, one thing we are always consider is I need as many patients through the door as possible. Um, but this has sort of given me the sense that maybe we should space things out a little bit more, be a little bit more diligent in terms of how many patients we see on a daily basis, make sure that things are safe and always clean and, and sanitized for our patients. Uh, not that we don't do that all, always already, but I think this sort of gives us a sense that we can sort of take a step back um, and, and sort of reduce the, the go, go, go of our practices and really to implement sort of things that make, make it even safer. And so those are a lot of things I will consider moving forward. Thank you, Dr. Ogilvy. And again, thank you to each of you for being here with us today and for your time and your partnership. And Thank you very, very much. Three tremendous experts. Let's go over ways that our, our viewers and our subscribers can contact each of you, starting with, starting with Dr. Meta. Yeah, um, so lots of different ways, you know, in this time of social media and everything. So we've got uh, Instagram handles. So that's at Meta Facial Plastics. Um, you can also do uh, give our clinic a phone call. Uh, so that's 301-657-5700. Um, you can find me online. Honestly, just Google me and you'll get to uh, my website um, where you'll find uh, an email address as well. So email works fine. Um, and then I actually, it was very interesting. I had a patient uh, message me through Facebook, uh, through a Facebook account. And so um, I have my business profile up there. And so these are all sort of indirect, uh, sort of, you know, not, not really HIPAA safe, but uh, it's a good way to start the conversation. And then um, we can always find more secure ways uh, via a, a telemedicine app or a phone call or something else to uh, have our uh, more uh, detailed discussion. But lots of ways out there. Googling us is probably the easiest. Thank you, Dr. Meza. Dr. Linkoff, how about you? Yeah, I think the, the best and probably most informative place for patients is uh, cityfacialplastics.com, which is my practice, and all the information is there. Uh, one of the things that I was able to do during this time off uh, was actually to rewrite my entire website uh, as far as the content. So what, you know, most of us, when we get a website um, made for us, it's like, you know, the, the the people who make it, they'll put in some text for different categories and you try to rank for them um, on Google. And, and that works okay. But then the new company I went with for my website, they said, oh, you know what? It might be helpful to, to update the, the content. And then I had all this time. So I actually wrote like all the content on all the new pages. So um, mm -hmm. it's a lot of work, but it, you know, it was, I think it's really a good thing for not just for ranking on Google, but for patients to actually go and, and truly learn something. Um, even if, you know, whatever, even if they don't choose me, that's fine. But at least they get to learn about um, different topics that, you know, I can I offer. So. Thank you, Dr. Linkoff. Dr. Ogilvy? Um, yeah, very similar. So uh, social handles are, you know, abound. So my Instagram handle is uh, at uh, Michael Ogilvy MD. Um, also on Facebook at Michael Ogilvy MD MBA. 
Um, Google is always a, a good way to get a hold of me. Our office phone number is 312-989-9091. Um, and like the two other panelists, I have a website that is actually going live probably early next week. Uh, which is ogilvyplasticsurgery.com. So uh, also many ways to get a hold of me and my staff and uh, easy enough to set up uh, virtual um, consultations or in-office consultations once we get more into the swing of things. Thank you. Thank you again to each and every one of you. Wishing you a great week, a great weekend ahead and continuation of the year and for everyone to stay healthy and safe. Great. Thank, thank you. Thank you again for your partnership. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks thank for you. having us. Thanks Appreciate it. Thank you.